Thanks, Claire. <coughs> Okay, um, look, we, we try to cover a, a variety of topics in our seminars that might be of interest, particularly to the public mental health sector. And um, I'm all, as a dietitian myself, I'm always an advocate for, for talking about, you know, we need to remember the, the pointy end of eating disorders, about eating behaviour, and my experience as a dietitian has just reinforced over the years how important that is. So uh, the, the mental health services don't, uh, have access to a, a lot of dietitians employed within their services so so that's a constant need that people identify as uh, where do we get access to people like that and uh, and there's also because of the the nature of research in eating disorders which is still kind of feeling its way and in the early days I think um, the the role of dietetics is often way down the list of priorities for getting research it's starting to happen and I think there's some new papers out just now isn't there that we're, that we're actually picking up every day at the moment so I think it's really timely to have an opportunity for both dietitians who may be um, just coming up against eating disorder clients a little bit and for mental health workers who are thinking about um, what might a, a dietitian offer my client and how do I work with this profession in helping people with eating disorders to hear about what the role of a dietitian might be. Um, <clears throat> now I, I, uh, I work with a couple of special interest groups that, for dietitians in eating disorders in, in Melbourne and our special interest group decided um, that, that that's, a, that's one task that they'd like to take on and I've asked two of my very experienced colleagues here to, to take on this talk today and I'll just introduce both of them. Terrell is the blonde. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's too objectifying for you. But <laughs> uh, and Terrell is a very experienced dietitian who's worked very long term in the area of body image and eating disorders extensively through the Royal Women's Hospital. Uh, she and I have worked collaboratively in uh, offering counselling and eating uh, body image explorations for dietitians over the years. Most recently she's been the, one of the dietitians at the Melbourne Clinic's Eating Disorders Program and has worked really long term in... Um, in private practice, look, uh, helping people with healthy eating and body image issues, um, with uh, PCOS and uh, kind of non-dieting strategies for long-term weight management resolution. <coughs> and Jo, who's the brunette, I suppose, <laughs> if we're going to talk about it in that way. Um, jo is currently working in private practice uh, and does a lot of work around eating disorders and body image issues as well. Uh, she's in the past worked at the Eating Disorders Program at the, um, the, the Royal Melbourne Hospital and extensively worked in uh, developing up their day program at that point, weren't you? So, so it, it's interesting, I'll just make a little comment that both of these people currently mostly work in private practice and I think that says something about funding for public <laughs> positions <laughs> for people who work in eating disorders. It's hard to get a senior position funded, isn't it? So I'll hand over to you, <laughs> to you now to talk about more than just a meal plan. Good morning, everyone. Um, what we'd like to do is to make this as interactive as possible and make it just a conversation between us and you. So we'd really like it if you put up your hand during the way and we just talk things about as we're going along. Um, we're moderately prepared. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk for a little while and then we've got um, a wonderful person, Shona, who's going to actually come and chat to us, who has a lot of experience of dietitians from a client perspective. So she's going to be part of our conversation as well. So I think. So just to get an idea of who's here, hands up if you are a dietitian. Good representation. Cool. Excellent. <laughs> Great. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess the first thing we want to ask is for those people who aren't dietitians. So this question is not for dietitians. Dietitians, sit on your hands. What do you think a dietitian is? Well, what do you think a dietitian does? Another way no one's going to be offended, even though there's like 40 of us here. <laughs> when you ask your client, when you ask your client to see the dietitian, what are you wanting from that? What are you expecting the dietitian to do from that? Thank you. I think the uh, first problem was the first question was a show of hands, and the second question was an answer to it. This is true. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> Let me warm up. I haven't had the coffee yet. Um, what the um, 
consumer experiences of a dietitian and what the dietitian is aren't necessarily the same thing. No, but uh, very for true. you as a worker... I, yeah, mm. I'll, I'll carry the houses like my mother. Yep. <laughs> for me as a, a health worker but not a dietitian, yep. as a fellow health worker who's focused on an aspect that I have, so I'm the, it's, and I think because being a nurse, I think of dietitian, physio, whatever, um, as being more focused on a particular type of, type of practice. Yep. And I think um, the, uh, the dietitian, in my experience, has um, expertise where I only have general mm -hmm. like yep. about food and um, nutrition and, and so on. And um, on the receiving end, um, the, the consumer or the patient, um, some might simplify it, saying this is the person that comes along and tells you what to eat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yep. it's also, it's what to eat and it could be when to eat and how to eat it and how best to cook it. And, Yep. So um, yeah, yeah, that's Good. But I think there's a, um, maybe a bit of a, a rigor and a science behind it that sometimes the patient or the consumer may not um, mm. um, appreciate. And I think sometimes other health professionals don't always appreciate other disciplines as, um, you know, discipline like the level of study and research. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Jump in anytime they like now. Yeah, has <laughs> anyone done well. any Excellent. impressions? Who else? <laughs> In a simplistic okay. way, when you ask a client to see a dietitian, what are you kind of wanting? I think it depends. So yeah. it depends on the, what the client's going for. So they might be directed by the GP because yeah. their cholesterol was somewhere or because of their weight or diabetes. Mm -hmm. It depends on the issue. Or yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, it might be because they've got a knee problem mm -hmm. and they need to lose weight because... Mm -hmm. So it obviously depends on the motivation and the actual focus point. Who actually helped refer them, um, mm. and whether that was a self-initiated idea or mm. something. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So I, I think then the approach by the dietitian would be different depending on what the mm. issue is. Mm. Yeah. And what we always say at our workplace is that people just go to the dietitian and say, "Tell me what to eat." Mm -hmm. Yeah. And but I always say that my dietitian is very bossy. <laughs> 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 we'll talk about some of the issues from our role. <laughs> I think sometimes, you know, like I've referred um, clients uh, in mental health uh, because um, they don't have a lot of money. Yeah. And so it was about the dietitian giving them sort of low cost. So some practical about, skills. Practical, yeah. Uh, very, yeah, on a very practical level. And I've been involved with dietitians in the community regarding yeah. sort of, you know, coaching practices and, you know, mm -hmm. assessing that sort of. So there's this. There's so many different angles, and I think yeah. um, different dietitians are alert to different issues, mm. sensitivities, obviously, um, mm. have specialist roles in different ways. Mm. Um, Can I absolutely. add to that? There's quite an um, extensive counselling role in that as well, mm. that perhaps I hadn't been aware of you know, until I started doing outreach with people. You know, yep. you know, it's not just about tell me what to eat, it's actually much more collaborative than that. Mm. You mm. know, support. Yeah. yeah. So the feedback sounds like that there is that um, quite a range of perspectives and quite a range of expectations and it sounds like for some people their experience has been that it's, it's helped you to develop a better understanding of a role of a dietitian. Um, but also you made some interesting points about, I, I can't say that far, sorry to say your name, <laughs> um, some interesting points about what the client's perspective was or whether they're motivated or not and those sorts of things which is always interesting. <coughs> I think often there is this frustration with often people are working with people and they just want someone to tell them what to eat. So there's this sense of eating disorder work is, is frustrating because just eat, just tell them what to eat. <laughs> and that's often reflected in people come in and they say, the GP sent me or the council sent me, they just said I need a meal plan, tell me what to eat. Mm. Um, what do you think, imagine you have someone who's deteriorating with an eating disorder of some kind, what do they, what do you think the client thinks the dietitian's going to do to them when they come to see, to them, see him? Make them eat. Make them eat? Eat lots of food. Eat lots of food? Mm. I love the assumption that we have the magic wand that makes them eat. <laughs> <laughs> From the client as well. I was making you somebody in a headlock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Getting a spoon up to them. 
Yeah. How many of you have... clients really sort of feel like the dietitian someone that they want to really engage with because they yeah. were obsessed about food. And Absolutely. Yeah. Is yes. natural sort of partner sometimes. Yeah. That's Even right. The dietitian knows. knows about food. And, yeah. then, and sometimes from a mental health perspective, that's a great relief because you yeah. can actually say, well, I mm. don't know. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit of a safety associated with dietitians. Yeah. Yeah. With the patients, it's like, oh, well, you're the nurse, which you probably know a bit, but I'll wait till I see the dietitian tomorrow and they'll, you know, I'll feel a bit better when they mm. guide me and watch me. So there's some mm. sort of authority just because we yeah. say it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it can go right up to the, uh, the other kind of continuum too that people might see a dietitian as some have quite authority but they might feel that that's a yardstick that they measure up very poorly to and mm. feel a lot of fear and shame in approaching yes. the dietitian. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I guess that a few of the things that you've brought up have kind of flagged one of the very first statements that came to mind when Terrell and I probably sat down and started thinking about this, which is that the clients know absolutely everything about food. Clients come in and they say, they tell me to come and see you, but I already, I already know about food. Yeah. So you won't be able to help me because I already know about food. Yeah, yeah. And, and I know what to eat, so you don't have to worry about it. And I, I, I know what happens to food in the body, so it's cool. And I know what I should be doing, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you're not going to make me do it anyway, so. <laughs> so I guess that's the biggest thing that can be a little bit of a, a hurdle in that first step, um, either referring on to a dietitian or the client seeing the value, that they do know everything. And I mean, yep, yeah, I've definitely had clients that know the kilojoule content of more things than I do. Mm. And um, Normally they do. Well, actually, they usually do. I want to know that myself. <laughs> this is very true. This is very true. <laughs> I guess the other thing that we come up against is dietitians are often the first place that someone will present if they recognise that there is something going on with their relationship with food that isn't okay. Anecdotally, dietitians don't have the word mental health in their title and they're not psychologists. And so for someone who's a bit unsure, it's often the first place they will present. Particularly in the community sector, where mm. there'll be a bit of hit and run as they're disclosing for the first time mm. what's actually going on. Yeah. It tends to go in one of two directions. People will either feel like the dietitian's a safe person to, person to talk to because it's all about food and body, or they'll feel like they never want to talk to a dietitian because it's about food and body, and they'll go down a psychological path first mm. more comfortably. So they tend they're often when you're trying to network people into services, you have to kind of be aware Ultimately, you want to spe the spectrum of treatment, but mm. it may be that people need to go in one direction first and then be helped into the other direction and finding the most comfortable direction for people to go in. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely a big part of it, I think. Mm. I haven't thought about that. But yeah. mm. I guess when we look at uh, the role mm. of the dietitian and the dietitian sitting within the team for treatment of eating disorders, it is uh, a role that sits very well because we know that, yes, eating disorders are a mental health illness, but they do have some very physical, physiological components that do need to be understood. And I guess that's something that we need to think about going through into looking at um, treatment and recovery and supporting someone. There needs to be the understanding of what's going on physically and mentally and the interaction between the two. And then of course when you've got someone who's at the lower end of the weight spectrum and might be quite physically compromised, that's when our um, uh, kind of more hospital clinical skills can come in to try and really get a handle on those sorts of things. Yeah. So from our point of view, what dietitians do have is they do have a lot of um, knowledge and background about physiology and nutrition. Um, particularly when someone is starving to some extent, that changes their physiology, it does change their cognition, changes mood, changes a lot of things and we're often in a position to start to untangle a little bit whether some of this feels a little bit physiological some of it or it feels primarily psychological or it's somewhere a mix of them in between there's often a lot of symptoms that arise often gut symptoms are a classic all sorts of things where we can kind of help untangle how much of this is physiological how much of this is psychological how much of this is an underlying disorder how much of this is probably due to the eating problem itself or how do you go about finding out I think, I mean, I trained at a time a long time ago when as a student I was told that as a dietitian you should never see anyone with an eating disorder because you're colluding with the problem mm -hmm. and that talking about food was, would make them worse. So dietitians had no role in treatment. Luckily that's totally changed over the years. <laughs> <laughs> so now we actually do, we have a much more recognised role in treatment which also recognises the physiology of eating disorders. And, um, 
but also that means that there were no signposts for me for gaining skills over the years so it's taken a lot of work for people like Michelle and myself um, Maureen there's a few others in here who are really over the years have had to develop their own uh, signposts and their own skills and to do that ethically always questioning boundaries that um, what you're doing is a is fits within the role of the dietitian and exploring all that luckily there's a lot more work being done on that now there's more research coming out about what our roles are and aren't so a dietitian will often depend on their level of skill the level of confidence the, the culture wherever they're working as to how much work the particular sorts that they'll do and what type of work that they will do and that there are a, there's a group of us who would who would function as specialists in this area who have a lot of experience or who have other skills and perhaps do a little bit more in this area. But a lot of our skills are in, there's no point in telling someone what to do if you can't work out whether they're ready to do it and how and how and best place and way that they can be helped to decide that they want to try things and do things. So having a lot of skills around behaviour change counselling and so forth. A lot of our skills are actually in understanding the social cultural context of things. A lot of work is putting things in, um, for instance, fear of carbohydrate. You have to understand that in a social cultural context to understand it in an eating disorder context. You know, 20 years ago, no one with an eating disorder was scared of carbohydrate, they were scared of fat. Now they're all terrified of carbohydrate. So social cultural issues do influence the belief systems within eating disorders. And being able to put people's experiences in, in the context of this weird world around weight and eating that we live in is often a really important part of what we do. As you notice, you'll find that um, because we work in a range of settings, we'll be doing ranges of different things in different settings. And some people will have more confidence, some people will have less confidence, some people will have networks to work with, some people won't. So it's kind of working out what your local dietitian can offer and how they can be supported in offering that as best. So like I said, there are a few of us who think we're slightly more specialised. <laughs> Um, this is just from one reference. There, are, there is more research coming out, but in fact, it's only recently that we've developed evidence-based practice guidelines for dietitians that are still being rolled out at the moment so that dietitians know what they're doing when they're treating eating disorders. But so a lot of it is actually understanding and collecting all the nutritional, behavioural information, all the background medical, social stuff, a good assessment like everybody does. A lot of it is actually looking at the rules and beliefs around food, about helping the client to understand that um, it's not about knowledge, it's a, it's a mental illness, it's not just about knowing, because clients themselves feel like, um, feel it's really difficult if you know it, but you're not doing it, and it's very shameful often to admit when you're an intelligent person that what you're doing is different to what you know you should be doing. So helping people to understand their beliefs and their feelings and their rules around food. Um, always looking at the whole spectrum of dieting behaviours, the whole binging, purging, restricting, understanding how that um, affects people's choices around the way they live and eat and bring, helping people to develop awareness of that. And then linking it into the physiological, how that then brings in symptoms that are related to starvation or to um, you know, the feasting, fasting type effects on the body and appetite and metabolism and mood and those sorts of things. So helping people to understand what's happening in their bodies and their behaviours from that perspective as well. So there's lots of, these days we would use lots of motivational interviewing type tools, lots of psychoeducation education put into that. Um, Self-monitoring is really interesting. People assume we're just going to make them keep diaries, but remember people can keep diaries for weight loss programs, they can keep diaries as part of being totally obsessed with everything. So um, they can keep diaries for the psychologist, the psychiatrist, the dietitian, even the GP gets them to keep diaries. <laughs> so self-monitoring, is there's quite a skill to using self-monitoring and to using it for particular purposes with that person that has a purpose. It's not really helpful just to do self-monitoring for no, without any particular reason for it. 
Um, and for some people it's very unhelpful to keep diaries. It actually doesn't help them with their eating problem. So being able to judge those sorts of situations and then being able to check that the people on the team are working together with that type of thing. Because people say, oh yeah, my psychologist is getting me to keep a food diary. You know, you're getting me to keep a food diary. How do we work as a team around this type of thing and how are we all using this information and how are we collecting it? But it's often an important tool that we'll be using. I guess when we're looking at eating disorders, we have to keep in mind that there's a real spectrum and often I'll talk about disordered eating and eating disorders as the one sort of thing. Um, sometimes because disordered eating is much less um, anxiety provoking for people when you're using that in conversation. But also I guess we have to keep in mind on one end we've got diagnosable eating disorders. They, they fit the criteria. They're what we're familiar with as our anorexia and bulimia and ethnos. And if we think about moving down to the spectrum to normal eating, now, I tend to, um, actually, I remember coming out of uni and people saying, you know, what's normal eating? I could tell you what to eat for diabetes, and I could tell you what to eat for heart disease, and I could tell you what to eat when you had celiac. But in terms of normal eating, I think it's something that isn't always approached, apart from the wonderful lectures that I had from Terrell. I've been around a long time. <laughs> so normal eating, the way that I've come to conceptualise it, is that normal eating is that place where we eat when we're hungry, we stop when we had enough, we're very flexible, we don't have any guilt around food. It's quite mythical. I think it would be rare to find someone who never has guilt or never questions what they're eating or why they're eating. So sometimes this concept of normal eating can be set up to be um, almost not a pinnacle, but also we have to take in mind that that's where we're aiming to get to a place where we're more flexible. If we think about those two extremes, in between, there's a whole range of behaviours and levels of um, being obsessed with food and body and weight and levels of unwellness we might term it. Before we hit the diagnosable eating disorders, there might be what we think of as the subclinical eating disorders, where we can see that someone is struggling, that it is having an effect on their lives, but their symptoms don't quite fit into that nice little package of a diagnosis. And then moving down towards normal eating, we have where people have some control over their eating, there's um, some level of restriction, so they might make an effort to read the labels and always avoid fat and, and count that, or they might never have sometimes foods, or junk foods, because it's something that they see as it might have a big effect on their weight. If we think about this spectrum, where do you think most people in, the, in a general population would sit? I've had <laughs> I think it's, it's important. In English, English speaking world. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think it's really important to think about and coming back to where Terrell was talking about the social cultural influence of the clientele that we're working with at the moment. A lot of restriction, being told um, or expecting to be able to control their body and weight and food. Exercise is, every day. Oh, exercise every day is a good one for an hour every day. Um, you know, you can't have anything with saturated fat. All of these messages that are coming across. And yet, if you get Kentucky Fried Chicken, so, or what used to be called that apple cake, so it brings the family together. It does, yeah. it does. Or it helps you with this girl yeah. you just said. Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful example. Wonderful Which, example. I mean, I mean, Silly, but no, no but the perfect. important perfect. distinction there is that no, normal does not necessarily equate to healthy. Yes. As in perfectionism around healthy. Hmm. That yeah. we would say that healthy is not perfect. No. And that is. And I think in our culture, only 20 years ago, healthy and normal would have been very close together. It's just that at the moment in the culture we're living in, there is a bigger gap between healthy and normal. So it used to be much easier to say normal eat eating equals healthy eating, just because of the culture we're living in. But in fact, normal eating is now not necessarily or particularly healthy eating. Mm. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be aiming as an outcome for our clients as perfect healthy eating. Our outcome still needs to be normal eating in this culture at this time in history because often there's a wish that the client will be able in the end not to become overweight or not to um, struggle with all the same things that we all struggle with in this culture but that wouldn't be recovery we we'd say oh we'll teach you perfect skills so that you will never have those problems but this is the real world otherwise we fall into the perfectionism thing as well I'll often explain to people, that particularly people who are reluctant to use labels or labels don't fit, the labels have big problems. 
Um, I would often say, look, in this culture at the moment, everybody struggles to some extent at some time during their life with issues around food, body and eating. Some people are really lucky and they never particularly worry about it <laughs> through genetics, through lifestyle, through all sorts of things. They're basically lucky. But most people struggle at some time of their life in some degree and it's only at the severe end that we tend to give it a label and the labels aren't, often aren't very helpful as far as describing. I was just going to say, I think um, part of that cultural environment mm. is that we just have an excessive amount of food. You're right, mm. exactly. Which we didn't have before. Exactly. Mm. The availability yep. yeah. is huge and, and it was really brought home to me, um, I was working with Sydney's community Southern Sydney's and uh, an elder was talking to a, a new one arrived and he said, oh, let's go and get something to eat or eat whatever. And I said, oh, I'm not hungry. And he said, no, in Australia, they eat to prevent hunger. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. And, and but that's what it would look like, wouldn't it? it? Yes, um, yes. So that's what we do. We yes. eat to prevent, we don't eat to prevent if you sat back on the wall and looked at human behaviour, that's Absolutely. a really good interpretation no, of what we're doing. That's actually extreme yeah. difference of cultural yeah. environment yeah. Um, from refugee camp to here. Mm. But nevertheless, it was, it was a beautiful phrase. It was lovely, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. And I guess it's something that, that those sorts of ideas of our um, eating behaviours as a general community are influenced so much by our normal social cultural nor our, our social cultural norms, our environment, the way we're brought up, that we eat for all of these reasons other than hunger. And a lot of these sort of concepts I actually end up discussing with my general clientele as well. Because people have you know, you ask them when they get hungry and they look at you stumped. And it's very much absolutely in our culture that you you eat because it's lunchtime. And you eat this because it's a lunch food. So it's a lot of influencing things we need to be aware of in working with this. And a final point about this is this is not related to weight. Mm. Someone can be very underweight, very overweight, and be at either end of the spectrum or anywhere along the spectrum. So it's not that it's a skinny person dying on television defines an eating disorder. Someone can be very large with an eating problem. Mm. Someone can be very large and have no issues with food, self, and eat really normally. And when I'm working, I work with people at both ends of the spectrum, I, I'm always working in the same way towards the same goal. Mm. So, which is normal, healthy eating, living that's sustainable, which includes a healthy weight, but it's not defined by weight. And often clients don't understand that. Um, someone was telling me yesterday, a dietitian, that their daughter at grade four Four, grade five is undergoing the local primary school body image talks at the moment that happened in, to include the video on what happens if you don't get it right the skinny girl dying and of anorexia oh. <laughs> sent oh. home as homework to discuss with the parents so, <laughs> <laughs> so you know when we're looking at supporting a client in the spectrum I guess we need to remember that it's always a team approach these sorts of conditions or issues or disorders, whatever we want to term them, they don't develop just because of one thing. There's lots of different components. And because there is so much influence physically, psychologically, on their social health, we need to keep in mind that we're part of a team. And that team might have a medical component, a psychological component, the nutritional component. And then, of course, as part of that team is always the family or the carer or the partner or whoever that person shares their immediate life with because no one ever has an eating disorder on their own. The whole house has an eating disorder, the whole family has an eating disorder, and I think it's very important that those sorts of things are evaluated and discussed and involved. The other thing is there's plenty of support organisations for us as clinicians, but also for people who are currently suffering from an eating disorder and their families. And so on a clinician level, we've got SEED, who have brought us all here today and do support clinicians in, um, as Michelle was talking about, in training and things, and then we've got the Eating Disorders Foundation, which is more focused at supporting the clients. I guess what we have to keep in mind, and something that often comes up, um, particularly when you're working in private practice, mm. and and or as it's a sole practitioner, yeah, sole practitioner, health yeah, or really hard to always define, is that the roles in the teams can overlap. So we've got the mental health practitioner and we've got the dietitian and we've got the medical practitioner and they might be you know, the GP or the nurse or the counsellor and all of the different roles that fall into those categories. But there is that sector where they really overlap. 
And it's, I think it's important to be understanding where that sort of comes from. If we look at what we would probably perceive as the core roles of each of these people, we've got our medical team who are going to be looking at their physical, biochemical, pharmacological, looking at the review and management, making sure they're physically stable. We would look at the mental health practitioner as looking at the psychological therapies, relationships, families, developing the coping strategies. And the dietitian is seen as, you know, looking at nutritional adequacy, doing the psychoeducation, looking at helping them to make those changes. Where we have to keep in mind is, oh, that was you. <laughs> <laughs> One of the overlapping bits in this is between, particularly between psychological and eating, is that eating isn't act, eating behaviour isn't owned by anyone. Now, dietitians aren't particularly trained in eating behaviour. Can anyone correct me if I'm wrong? <laughs> <laughs> um, psychologists, how well trained do you feel in or mental health workers in eating behaviour itself? It's actually an area that's only recently even people have got interested in. And it's very, very complex because it really is the mixture of the biological, social, cultural, physiological. And so it's people who are interested in it and have developed skills over time coming at it from their different perspectives that work in that area. So a dietitian will bring an understanding to eating behaviour that a psychologist will bring a different understanding to, but both are valuable and both are needed. Because sometimes we get into this argument about I'm doing this, you do that, you'll sort of thing. CBT I'm doing so therefore you do that. But it, it's actually we needed to be bringing it from all perspectives because it's actually very complex, not particularly um, well researched and understood and not an easy work area to work within. But it's actually if people are going to move into recovery, if they're going to move beyond following um, meal plans and rules and things that we give them, they have to be able to reconnect to their body and to learn to eat normally again. And there's often this assumption in eating disorder recovery, oh, they'll know how to eat once they've done the psychological work and they recover. It's not actually true. People become totally um, lost and scrambled and disoriented to what on earth is normal eating, particularly if they've had a long history of an eating problem. And learning to eat normally again is a whole different set of skills to learn to be able to recover. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. It's quite hard work. And so often people will get to a certain weight, oh, they're fine, they're moving on, you know, their weight's okay, they're all right. But in fact, in their heads, they're just as unwell because a lot of this body reconnection, eating reconnection work has, has never really been done. Um, this was just to point out, in that area, it's often we are all working with things about how you can listen to yourself with body, what the fears are, what the, you know, what all the feelings are around food. It's not just, here, eat this at this time and you'll be nutritionally replenished. And that a psychologist might be working with that, a dietitian might be working with that, a GP might be working with that, a psychiatrist, but the point is the team's working together. That the message is being given and the things that people are working on are working together. And I guess then keeping those sorts of things in mind, we can see that these three roles, there's quite a lot of overlap in um, supporting a client with anxiety management, in minimising compensation behaviours, in the family support and education, looking at ongoing referrals. Um, I find I feel like a bit like a triage nurse sometimes because if a client does come and I'm the first person they've talked to in um, a private setting, you're kind of think, laying down the groundwork that they need to see a GP and they need to see a mental health worker and, and doing those sorts of things. Uh, risk assessment. Um, body image, the self-acceptance, and, and working with those impulsive behaviours. I think one of the things we do need to keep in mind is just because a client is here to see the dietitian doesn't mean they're going to be able to switch off the other stuff that's going on. So there is times that a client will come in and there is a risk issue. Um, or there is times that the client will come in and they're so overwhelmed with distress, a particular issue, that you do need to be able to hear them and support them through that. Obviously appropriately within our boundaries and, and referring on and directing to the um, mental health worker or psychologist. But being able to do those that basic screening and, and risk assessment, I've actually found incredibly helpful working in this um, clientele because you can't ignore what they present when they're in the room. So you can see that looking at the emotional part of eating, looking at the all of those other reasons that what's going on, there is the overlap of trying to support a client and looking at helping them through 
to that point we're talking about of normal eating. If we go back to our spectrum and think about where the role of a dietitian actually sits within that, again, down our diagnosable eating disorder end, we're looking more at trying to give the client some structure, trying to contain um, them, their anxiety, trying to look at the nutrition information and providing them with correct nutrition information, supporting them obviously with adequate energy and adequate nutrition, looking at the rehabilitation towards that more normal eating. So that will be, they need a meal plan. <laughs> Every week, they need a meal plan. <laughs> what we're trying to do is to provide someone who is very unwell um, with some structure and some external safety. So when the internal um, voice of the eating problem is so strong that they're just tortured all day long making decisions and it's totally driven by the eating disorder, what you're trying to establish is a relationship where people trust you enough mm. that they will allow you to, to do an external plan that might give them an alternative to the eating disorder voice. We don't expect them to follow it 100%. We know it's not, you know, going to cure anything. <laughs> <No. laughs> but what it is, is it's, you're, it's part of the conversation you're having with someone to try something and to feel safe enough to try something in spite of all the huge fears that they're battling. So it's, it's just an external source of an alternative path that they could try. But we want to be careful what often happens, people go to hospital at the at, um, discharge, you're giving a menu plan and that menu plan becomes the new set of rules. Mm -hmm. So it becomes the eating disorder voice in a way. So we, we keep on trying to introduce the idea that it's not all black and white, it's not all about rules, um, it's that there can be some degree of flexibility. You don't need 100% control, but it can be quite a journey to get there. So the meal plan is kind of, it's not the be all and end all, it's more <coughs> the product of the conversation you've had with the person, try to get enough trust and trying to give them an idea of what they would be able to do that might head them in a better direction, slowly, slowly. So, and the type of meal plan that's, if I'm working with someone in private practice, then the type of meal plan that, or meal planning I would do with someone is really different to the type I would do in a very supportive environment, such as in a hospital environment. So it depends as well on where you're working with people, what the capacities for support are, and what their needs are at the time. And it's also important to be able to, you, you've talked about yeah. building up the trust with the client to have that engagement to give them something. Sometimes your initial meal plan might be as simple as something as adding water regularly during the day. Which, of course, if someone is at physical risk, that's not <coughs> ideal. But if someone is at a place where you can work with baby steps, sometimes I will think about, okay, here's the meal plan I've given this person. You know, it's hard to sit with that from a, from a mm -hmm. professional point of view, but also it's about understanding that this client needs to see that the baby steps, those little changes, those little wins against the eating disorder, helps to grow their confidence and helps to grow their tr belief and their, their confidence and trust in the treatment team as well. Looking down our continuum of care, we've got our general population at the moment with um, some restraint and with some misunderstandings about food and really we're looking at that reinforcement of having variety and being able to be flexible and spontaneous and as a client is moving further through this, that would be where we'd start working on moving off a meal plan into being able to substitute, being able to have sometimes foods. Um, being able to, and plenty of clients have had lots of challenges of going out and practicing eating coffee and cake and things like that. Challenging foods that are a little bit scary, but challenging them often enough that they're no longer scary. It's not about have chocolate once, gee whiz, you've had chocolate. It's about <laughs> doing the same thing often enough to feel um, safe, that it's mm. no longer as scary. And not getting people to do the scariest things, but to do the little things that are going to slowly build their confidence. Because you're asking them to lose a bit of control and that's terrifying. The best, touching on that, the best way I ever had a client describe it was with her, she, she's standing on the edge of the cliff and when we ask her to change something, to eat something new, whether it be a carrot or chocolate, we're asking her to just jump off. There may not be a parachute, there may not be a mattress at the bottom, but we're just asking you to jump off and that's the level of fear and anxiety that is going on for these people that we really need to be able to appreciate. Moving down our, our continuum, we're looking more at starting to really connect with that internal 
with our body, with what it's telling us, being able to trust the body, being able to um, read when you've had enough, being able to recognise the hunger and really looking at building up a better relationship with food and looking at preventing those relapses and, and in a general community, often you're working at that end to really help people to understand and trust their bodies to prevent um, any sort of disordered eating and things like that really coming in. So a lot of sometimes what you're offering is just support and reassurance and again that external voice that they know but they need to hear mm -hmm. regularly even if we're not actually doing a lot of behaviour change. Mm. And often clients will sit there saying, now I know you told me this this last week and I know we had this discussion, but I need to talk about it again. Because the voice in their head, whether we talk about it as a voice or intrusive thoughts or however their eating disorder presents, is with them 24 hours a day. And we might see them, depending where you are, from 10 minutes to an hour in a week to say, no, this is okay, this is, what we, this, this is what's really going on, this is what we need to do. So having that external reinforcement, I think, is a really powerful thing once somebody does have trust in the team. So one of the challenges for us is that we'd love to think that we're really client-centred. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality for us is sometimes we have to take on the role of the one who is provide. It's almost like um, the firm parenting, kind but firm, firm but kind stuff, to, because people are so unwell. So we're often the one who ends up in that, um, in that role of, of setting some boundaries and needing to find ways to bring people along with you, but having to be quite clear about asking people to do things that they're not ready to do. And people struggle with this idea of, you know, all the best latest theories is people should only be able, you know, really asked to do things they're ready to do. But in the nature of eating problems, they can be physically so unwell that um, we need to ask them at times to do things that they're not ready to do. And that's, that's difficult for us as practitioners at times. So, but, but, we, but being aware that we're shifting, a, shifting different roles at different times. Yeah? I'm just conscious there hasn't been any interaction for a while, so I thought I'd yeah. jump in. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Go on. <laughs> we're about to have some good interaction. Um, yes. It might be a semantic difference, but we shouldn't confuse um, client centred with client directed. Yes, yeah, that's and, right. Um, I was in a discussion about something else. Or, but, um, it was starting to sound like we were um, shaping the patient around the service. So we turned around and shaped the service around the patient. But it was the patient um, as, as our expertise identified their needs, not necessarily, but partly what, what they were telling us. I suppose working at a children's hospital, if you always did what the patient wanted, you probably wouldn't <laughs> ever stick a needle in or um, yeah, yeah. give them medicine or whatever. But mm. it's, um, it's a balance between being client directed and client centred too sometimes. We That's right. Mm, exactly. Mm, absolutely. Do you have a, um, any experience um, as workers being um, not actually seeing the client, being a consultant for the other workers? Yep. Mm. Oh, yeah. The, the three examples oh, yeah. you have, each one of those could be absolutely. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the work that we can do can be secondary consultation. Mm. Um, and that's very, because people are often, they're working with everyone in their team often around eating, particularly say Sharon's an outreach worker, so for outreach you are working with all this stuff all the time. So and we <coughs> don't need to see the client yeah, yeah. to mm. do that, to, to know that, um, just to do the secondary consultation. Mm. And I think that can happen across all levels if you're looking at sort of mm. inpatients that the dietitian might be helping to really develop some overall structure within a ward. If you're looking at a private setting, the, the client might not be ready to actually engage with the scary person who talks about food, so you might actually be just providing some ongoing support and feedback and really just listening to the person they are engaged with, whether it be the psychologist or the doctor, and just helping to support them until the client is ready. So I think it's a really fabulous point actually to bring up. Mm. There is a lot of that going on. Mm. Or it might be we're providing clinical supervision Absolutely. to other dietitians working in isolated places. Yeah. I think that's a great role, but I also think that there's, um, in my service, we're really um, experimenting with or doing, a model which is a mental health and, and dietetic um, collaborative model. Yeah. yeah. So um, you do the assessment together. Yeah. And I think that there's yeah. a lot to be said for that. Like, if it's only, you know, but I don't necessarily take, like, lots of mm. clinician hours, but because then you've got a shared formulation and understanding. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. No decisions about, should I see the mental health 
profession, yep. should I see the dietitian for this period? You know, can be taken together. Absolutely, that's right. And I think yeah. that there's a lot to be said for having that exactly. sure face to face. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Secondary consultation is great as well. But yeah. But if you can, I mean, um, nothing beats doing your own assessment of the situation. And, and together, because and together. Then you learn the language of the other right. person and what mm. questions yep. they ask and you know, yep. all that sort of thing. So you get that. Mm. Sort of down mm. to the ground sort of understanding of what the dietitian can do or what the mental health person does as well which yeah. I think mm. in the end is to the benefit of the client oh, and it's the pleasure of working in eating yeah. problems is mm. that you're working collaborative with, with people all the time so if you can yeah. do it yeah. Oh, yeah when you when you've got that team and being able to I remember um, working on the unit some of the time I would sit down and do my assessment with the psychiatrist and it was the most amazing learning experience to watch them do an assessment, to get an understanding of the client, but to just help to develop my own skills and my own understanding and to appreciate things. But also that was the way that um, the consultation, the consultation, the um, consultant I was working with at the time was actually learning about the role of the dietitian and what questions we would ask and where we would go with it. So I think that's really valuable. Hmm. Hmm. I just say, to, yeah. as an outreach worker, like working collaboratively, sort of like with other um, designations without actually speaking with you because like I see clients that have a psychiatrist, a psychologist, <laughs> a, um, you know, a dietitian and so there's all these different people that are seeing them so my concern is that I don't want to be giving them different information or being conflicting mm. so I can check in with the client and say well what does, you know, what does Joe say, mm. what, what, mm. way, what track is Joe taking with this issue mm. or whatever so that I'm feel like I'm on the same wavelength as you, even though I'm not actually, yeah. I'm not yeah. actually communicating to you, but I'm not doing it through the yeah. phone. Yeah. So that I'm actually not giving a different message, I'm trying mm. to sort of say, well, I'm going to try and give the, mm. you know, the same message, mm. you know, be on the same path. Well, that's the Absolutely. best scenario yeah. where the client is. Yeah. 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 So that's, I guess, that's sort of keeping that client centred. Mm. Yeah. Really. And of course, with any sort of, of treatment, trying to maintain the communication with your team. And I guess that's lucky sometimes when you've got the same people all the time because you work out how they work and what they do and, and you understand them. But yeah, it's great to be able to go back to the client when you can't check in with everybody every day because that would be completely time consuming. But that team communication is always key. And being brave enough too to realise that the GP is probably struggling as much as you're struggling, the psychiatrist is probably struggling as much as you're struggling. Everybody tends to be struggling and that in fact it's often really good just to make that contact and just check where the rest of the team's at as well, mm. which can be a lot of work. And that the, that some of the issues with working with these clients in community sectors or privately is that the degree of anxiety and the degree of work per client is, is kind of through the roof. A little bit about your history and your experience of, of programs you've been through. Yeah. Yeah, the brief. Okay. The outline for people. <laughs> um, well, I was diagnosed um, at around 14 with anorexia nervosa, and um, at that time I got into the children, all children's yep. in the medical unit there, and also been throughout the Austin uh, system inpatients and the Royal Melbourne inpatients and day program, and the Melbourne Clinic um, inpatients day program and outreach services. Fantastic. So, over the past, yeah, I suppose about 10, 12 years. Okay, so over yeah. a period of time. Yeah. And how many dietitians do you think you've seen over that time? Oh, probably about 10 or something like that. I think we sort of managed to work out. So. Yeah. 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 So when we realised that, we decided that Shona really is the expert <laughs> <laughs> about dietitians in eating disorders and able to give us a bit of a perspective. And an expert on the Melbourne system. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and it's changed over time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I get I guess the place to start is thinking about you you've been through a lot of different programs. Mm -hmm. What's some of your initial thoughts thinking about the role of the dietitian within your treatment? Um, I suppose it's very like when I was really unwell, I was really, really scared of dietitians. <laughs> I didn't at the time I I suppose I didn't want to be made to eat and um, I thought they'd, as soon as I'd see them I'd just get more increases and I didn't want that to happen and I just wanted to keep on doing what I was doing and whatever because it was too scary so I suppose but now though because I'm in a lot better place um, yeah definitely not as scary <laughs> and um, actually um, yeah I think you can once you develop trust and a good relationship with one you can really work well with them and get through all the hard sort of stages that you have to go through to get to where you want to be in the end so um, yeah so so just 
um, for people who might not have worked um, with someone who's been an inpatient and those things, you talked about that the dietitian was quite scary initially. Yeah. yeah. So what happened in the early days at the Children's <laughs> in the Austin? Um, What's it like? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it was bed rest um, at the Children's, um, being sort of obviously told what to eat, not having much choice at all. Um, sort of uh, nasogastric feeding was a threat if you didn't get eat all of your meal plan within like 24 hours you've got a tube feeding and that sort of thing so mm. um, I suppose I didn't re obviously didn't obviously want that at all but it also probably saved my life in a way because I just was so sick and so unwell that I couldn't eat or make a decision for myself or mm. um, yeah stuff like that so and also sort of being monitored all the time like me trying to get off the bed and walk around and then being told to get back on the bed all the time and mm. stuff like that being monitored in the toilets and showers and mm. yeah sort of a lot of your decisions and your control is taken away from you I suppose so um, which can make you feel really powerless in a way mm. or not really um, yeah not involved at times in yeah. your treatment but I suppose that can be necessary as well. Mm. Yeah. So in terms of those times when you do feel quite disempowered and you haven't mm. got a choice, how did that actually make you feel in terms of focusing on recovering and making changes? Mm. Um, it's quite hard because I sort of got into a pattern of um, sort of relying on other people to tell me what to do or to not make decisions myself mm -hmm. with getting better. Um, yeah, I used to almost give all power over to the treatment team once I got into hospital or mm -hmm. something like that. So. And what effect would that have when you were discharged? Uh, I suppose when you're discharged, then you're left with, they have all this support for so long in the inpatient setting, you get discharged and sort of, if you're not having a lot of outpatient mm -hmm. support or day program, things like that, you just left on your own again it feels like that and you just sort of think oh, I'll just do what I was doing like mm. I don't have all these people around me telling me what to do and you know that constant supervision and um, support so it just makes it quite it sort of fall back on my family as well I suppose so yeah. your family become the carers and the support sort of thing yeah. but um, that so can be the treatment team yeah almost. that can be quite difficult for them as well I suppose yeah absolutely so what would happen to the discharge meal plan? <laughs> um, probably not looked at once I, <laughs> once I got home really, when if I was just not wanting to, or oh, not feeling motivated I suppose to recover or just wanting to um, just I suppose side with the eating disorder and yeah, um, yeah I suppose. But, um, I suppose gradually over the time I realised that I actually needed to look at it at some point and actually try and yeah. follow it and actually otherwise I'm just yeah. going to go in and out, in and out all the time, you know, for however long. So yeah. um, I suppose it took me a while to realise that as well. <laughs> but yeah. And, and moving from those first few early years where, where your dietitians were quite scary and you felt a little bit disempowered, mm -hmm. what was your experience starting to move more into? Uh, a day program or um, yeah, what began to make a difference? Yeah, um, <laughs> I suppose also, you know, realizing that just seeing the dietitian doesn't mean just talking about food and meal plans and increases or things like that. Much that might only be five or ten minutes sometimes of the session as well. Like mm. looking at the whole picture and what's actually going on for you, and you know, looking at why you might be doing certain things or why you know certain behaviors are still there or you're struggling I don't know to eat this certain food or I don't know um, I suppose more supportive and also um, even just sort of like in day program I remember you Jo used to sometimes come in and eat with us at morning tea and stuff like that you know just to keep an eye on us probably because <laughs> I, I used to always eat out the whole chocolate box yeah, I know. <laughs> every time all these boxes and I'm sitting there with my dried apricots or something you know <laughs> probably like tiny like little mm. ones you know small as I could find in the bag or something you know <laughs> so, mm. so that um, modeling behavior yeah and just feeling oh well, like it, I began to be able to see that if other people would sort of doing things possibly maybe I could do that you mm -hmm. know it's like when they're okay they're not whatever you know you think in your head's going to happen to you in a way 
So you woke um, up the next day and fit into your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, but you talked yeah. about meeting a different psychiatrist at that time and yeah. moving into a different program. What yeah. a difference that made. Yeah, just a specialised, I think, treatment, having multiple people in your treatment team that cared, or I felt people cared about me and were really wanting me to move forward and try and get my life back. It wasn't sort of, sometimes it felt sort of, some ways some treatment feels like a punishment sort of based, you know, if you don't eat this, this will happen type thing. So I sort of felt that I was almost gonna go against that sort of, um, I don't, you know, you don't, I suppose you need to think, oh, who cares, I'll just do what I want sort of thing. Like I'm gonna get, gonna get punished anyway or get restricted even more. So, um, so that rebellious side sort of It wasn't a out. trusting sort of thing. I didn't yeah. felt people were even asking me what I felt as well, mm -hmm. like, or what I thought about the situation. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it is hard when you're obviously really unwell and just your end sort of dominating you so much mm -hmm. and your thinking and your behaviours. So, but I mean, you're still a person underneath all that in a way. So if people can try and get into, you know, try and see that as well. And not just the eating disorder side of you, I think, helps a lot. Mm. Yeah. Is there any other things you can um, remember working with um, the, your dietitians and your team and, and meal plans and things during that sort of, um, when you started doing a bit more of the day program and you're yeah. feeling a bit more kind motivated? getting ready for recovery yeah. and stuff. Yeah, I think the food challenges, like going out, eating morning tea or dinner out and things like that as a group really helped. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really, really scary. I remember my first time going out for coffee and cake and I was just freaking out and it was just the worst thing in the world. And and now I go actually go out with friends and, you know, we'll just do that. Like, mm. it's a nice thing to catch up with people and it's not really a massive big deal. But I suppose at the time when you're in that place, it's the worst thing in the world. But mm. over time, the more and more I have challenged those things and gone out and try to listen to the people around you that are telling you it's okay and that reassurance. Um, yeah, it really does get easier. I mean, it takes a long time, I think, and that's different for different people as well. Um, I've got a question. I'm just wondering, um, was there something about the group that helped you take that first, you know, to eat something when you went out on that first um, cafe, was it? Yeah. What, what was it that helped you to sort of jump off the process? Yeah. Um, Having other people, like other so patients and stuff, other people yeah. around you, doing it with you and the facilitators um, and seeing like if other people at different stages, they might be able to do something much harder and then you think, oh wow, this, you know, I'm doing this easiest thing. Um, so I like seeing where they've come from as well. Um, I'm trying to explain it. Um, so being able just to see that other people have felt how you have, but have actually have, achieved it. Yeah, as mm -hmm. well. So sort of why can't I do that? Just sort of putting those thoughts into your head that, you know, it is okay. Like, um, and I sort of really wanted to try. Like I was just so over going in and out of hospital for so long and just being sick and losing a lot of things in my life. So um, I had to do something. It was sort of like a last resort. Like what else was I going to do? Like if I didn't sort of work hard at this and stop everything else in a way, you know, focus on getting better and stuff, so, um, yeah. yeah. I've got a couple of questions. Yes. Um, you've really been um, informative about saying how important it was to develop a trusting relationship with various health professionals that you don't we're talking about today. Is there anything that you remember as being particularly important that dietitians were helpful with? And also, I guess, on the opposite end of the day, is there any experience you've had that was really helpful? <laughs> <laughs> um, really I'll start with the non helpful <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's quite hard because um, I think for me, like getting too many increases at once, like to say in an inpatient setting, was quite overwhelming and just. I suppose actually having a discussion about how you want to, if you need an increase, how you're going to do that and what's sort of the best way that you're not freaking out but you're still pushing yourself sort of thing and getting to that next step. Um, oh, 
it's hard. I suppose... Mm. You talked about yeah. um, you, in a way, knowing before the rest of people knew that you were ready to make your own choices. Yeah. That at some stage it, you shifted to deciding for yourself what your next yeah. choice would be mm. and having to convince the team that you were ready to make those choices. Mm. Because it's quite hard for so long if you've sort of been told what to eat, what to do, you know, and then to try and get that power back in a way and to think, no, I am ready to do this. Like, I am ready to decide this for myself and, um, yeah, and sort of take that next step to move to the next spot, I suppose, that you need to do. Um, I suppose, yeah, the good thing is I feel... Um, being able to talk about other things as well as the food stuff and I suppose getting reassurance around what you are doing because sometimes you think what you're doing is wrong or bad or um, worse than what it really is or, if that makes sense um, so helping you the, the reassurance that you're not colluding with the eating disorder or that you're doing better than yeah. you think yeah because it gets confusing when if you're trying to decide things yourself like is that the eating disorder deciding it or is it you really wanting to do this or is it, you know, I want to have this, is that a restrictive thing or is it, like, you know, is it coming from an eating disorder thought or is it, no, I actually feel like this and I feel like this today, like, mm. I don't have to have chocolate every day to sort of prove to people that I'm getting better or, you know, if I can have it when I want it and eat it, like, that might be okay, you know, sort of. So it's really learning what you like. Isn't yeah. Yeah. It's really hard, and also if you've been put on meal plans and also just told what to eat all the time, it's like, what is the right thing for me? You know, what do I really feel like? You know, to eat, and that's quite hard. It sounds quite a simple concept, but when you've been governed by rules or your head and the eating disorder telling you what to do for so long, um, it gets quite confusing and challenging to sort of. Um, get your head around that concept in a way, I think. Yeah. So I really like the way uh, that you um, described that about getting down that concept of almost normal eating that Joe was talking about before. Um, I've got a question that's actually for you, Shona, yeah. and, and both Joe and Cheryl too, actually. Just thinking about when you were younger, Anil, and then you would have been living with your family. Family, yeah. yeah. And I'm just wondering about what role the dietitians had with your family and you talked about you going home with them about what what is the place for you, you think for dietitians with your family and I mean just what Joe and Cheryl's view about that too being mm. obviously the person that's the one that's struggling with the eating disorder is a prime person but for somebody young who's living with the family as you described. Yeah um, well I was, at the time the in the children's they used to encourage your parents to be monitoring your food and get the meal plan making your food for you sitting like you know sitting with you and stuff like that while you're eating so um that was it sort of worked for a while but then i sort of as i grew a bit older and became wanting to sort of in a way do my own thing and then they were sort of still trying to tell me what to do what to eat could see i was really unwell i was trying to help but then it became that conflict thing you know and it became quite um a bad environment to sort of being at home and then I felt bad and then they felt bad and then everyone was just arguing every day about what I was going to do and what I was going to eat and you know so even going shopping can be just you know like torture sort of thing you know because mm. you know oh, mum I you know I have to have this one I have to have that you know I have to have this particular brownie yogurt with this flavour and like you know what I mean like, this mm. is like um yeah so in a way hospital was a relief them you know in me in a way respite yeah <laughs> yeah that's right word actually um so when you were back at home again would you see the dietitian or you and your parents no I, I always just saw her on my own okay. so mm -hmm. i don't think yeah i don't think my parents my parents used to come to the pediatrician sometimes and things like that they take me to her but not really the dietitian at all so i don't know if might have helped them as well if they'd come maybe at that time um, Hopefully yeah. that's an area where there's a lot of change happening mm -hmm. and that we're moving into a much more family-centred way of doing things, particularly, I should say, where people are younger and there's Maudsley and things like that. But hopefully as dietitians now, you would mm -hmm. primarily work 
with the parents without mm. even necessarily having to see the child mm. in lots of situations. Because parents are often, as you said, parents don't know what to do as well. And the and um, we used to laugh as dietitians when they say, "Oh, stay away from the family therapy or the you know don't you know just do food with the person kind of thing." You'd go, "Yeah, but they bring the fight into the office. Mm -hmm. It's all about the food <laughs> and the weight, mm. and everybody is is struggling with it." Mm. So mm -hmm. it's really important now to work with with families, I think. And I think it's something that it needs to be looked at with the case and the age and the situation mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. But you're absolutely right that I've always found, um, we used to do a <coughs> session at um, RMH where on day program the family would come in and we'd all have a meal together with the client mm -hmm. and some practitioners and the family and it comes in with <coughs> them. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a really powerful way of seeing what's going on, how the family's interacting with the eating disorder with the client are they understanding what some of our premises are as dietitians around why we say you have to have normal milk versus skinny milk and those sorts of things and actually having that opportunity for everyone to discuss it together and to give feedback and provide feedback and talk about situations where the client was part of the conversation to say it's really helpful when you do this and it's really unhelpful when you do that but doing that on a out of the home environment was really powerful so I think it's something that can be quite important and the other side of it is also helping families to develop enough trust in you, that, <coughs> as Shane said, as the person tries to be more responsible for themselves and the family needs, has to adjust again and perhaps sit back and watch decisions they're not comfortable with. How can the family have enough trust in the team to be part of it but allow the person to take more risks and maybe not always make the best decisions and how we all handle that? hard for me to do that really I didn't it was I still think it's only till I sort of moved out into um, separate sort of housing that I really developed my own sense of independence and I realized well this, this is me I need to make this decision I'm the one that's going to go back into hospital if I don't do this myself um, sort of thing because I mean who else really is going to do it in the end like my parents can't do it for me or the doctors and the nurses, whoever, like dietitians can't really do it for you. Um, yeah, I suppose my parents still a bit struggle with that. Like I might go home and, you know, go out and not be like, you know, but you should be eating this, you should be eating that type thing, you know, why aren't you eating this for? And it's like, you know, ease off a bit. It's quite hard. Um, it is a lot easier now because I'm not living there anymore sort of thing and I'm not as involved. Um, but um, now I feel confident because I have been... I haven't been out of ho in hospital in the past about 10, nearly a year, uh, 10 months, nearly a year, that I must be doing it okay, you know, like I must, I am doing it myself and look, can you please, like, you know, ease off, I don't want to talk about this, you know, sort of stuff, I don't know. Um, but when I was younger, it was quite hard for me to do that and I was more unwell, so, you know, they... I mean, you can't blame them in a way. They were trying to help me and they could see their daughter deteriorating. So, mm. you know, I suppose... Mm. It sounds like, again, we've come to that point of knowing when to shift yeah. from that sort of supportive team into letting you make some decisions. Yeah. Mm. Um, one of the things that, um, that I learnt when I talked to you about all this, preparing for this, was you talked about what it's like to like and to trust the dietitian that you're working with but then what it's like when they give you the meal plan. Mm -hmm. And that you have and to the, do it. And you, like, and you, you know like you that it's just, it. you can't do that. Yeah. Um, well, that's what makes it scary often to go and see people again, because I felt that I couldn't do it anyway or meet the expectations or um, they don't feel bad about that, so I wouldn't go. And I just felt guilty about not being able to do it. and. So wanting to please the dietitian. Yeah, and I sort of knew, as, oh, I said to myself, I knew I was going to say, you know, 
what to do and mm. stuff like that. I've sort of done this for a while. <laughs> so <laughs> I was just like, the dietitian what you thought she wanted to hear or he wanted to hear. Yeah, well, sometimes I've, I honestly I would lie about what I was doing as well, you know, yeah. just yeah. to not sort of feel bad about mm. really what I was doing. And mm. I mean, you know, if you're losing weight and you're saying, yeah, I'm eating all this food, how does that sort of, you know, <laughs> generally, how does that add up, add up really? So, yeah. Um, Increase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, no, no, would there have been any level of a meal plan that you would have felt comfortable with, that you felt you could have achieved, or was any meal plan a dietitian going to give you unrealistic? Yeah, I suppose it, I felt like that in my head was just like minimize whatever. I was on the lowest thing probably possible, and I'd be like, okay, I want to try and cut it down to this, you know, yeah, sort of it's thing. Really so, and then you get more increases anyway, and you think, oh gosh, I thought that was a lot at the start. And now yeah. I'm eating all this now, you know. So it's just like more in an impatient setting, I suppose that is, yeah. you know, mm. more relevant. Um, but um, and I guess that's why yeah. we, the meal plan's not the gospel. It's yeah. actually the the, the counselling and the support and the, mm. the session, the, the being there that goes with mm. it, that is what's that goes with the meal plan that mm. we would see as a value in. Mm. And perhaps the working collaboratively to develop it. Yeah. In an inpatient setting, there's often some standards that this is where you start and we increase or decrease or change from here. Mm. Um, but I guess more in looking at a day program or outpatients, mm. you kind of a bit more of, okay, this is what you're doing. Could we change this and this and build on this part of it? Mm -hmm. so, um, one more question, I think we'd better keep yeah. moving. Just on your plans, um, uh, we have discussions with our team about, um, I'm an outpatient setting for a three day day patient program, um, and we have discussions about do we keep up, up, up in meal plans um, if the patient isn't following them outside of the program? And I suppose one side of the team is saying, well, um, setting them up to feel a little bit kind of disempowered mm. but the other side saying well they're only going to follow 20 40 percent anyway so why not keep kind of setting that boundary high what are your thoughts on the two different approaches well i think oh it's hard yeah. um but keeping on increasing i don't think is really a solution like i feel really um it's just going to keep on making you feel even more worse in a way about mm. so why not try and even just maintain it at a certain level, like try and get the person to maintain it at a certain level for a little bit mm -hmm. and then maybe then bump it up a little bit, like not sort of just keep on, mm -hmm. I don't know, it just seems a bit pointless, like, I don't know. Yeah, like I can feel I can manage this, mm -hmm. like, um, it's a bit hard because I mean some people at different stages as well and could, you know what I mean, deal with, you know, could probably cope with things and at different times you know depending on what's going on but then I you know if I just kept on getting increases and I, I mean eventually I sort of ended up back in hospital or something you know if it was that bad in the end I don't know um, so I guess yeah. these dilemmas reflect a lot of the treatment dilemmas within services as well so it sounds like you know logical why would you ask someone to do what you know, they're not ready to do and why not help support them to be ready for things and maintain it and we'd like to move in that direction but there's a long history to the way we treat eating disorders and lots of dilemmas and lots of focus around particular issues around weight and food and so forth and there's mm. lots of change still to happen over time but things are moving in a much better direction that we can even have these conversations now. Mm. Mm. Okay. Okay. So we might Thank move you on. Very Thank you so much, much Shona. Thanks. <laughs> so look, so just as so what we what you might expect when your client does see a dietitian is that hopefully that they're going to do a really good assessment as you've and hopefully it will be in conjunction with assessments with other members of the team as well. Or in some way you're collaborating with the rest of the team. Because sometimes it's not clear. I mean it's not as simple as this is an eating disorder. Some people have other comorbidities and the eating issues are, are just a symptom of all of that. Some people are just stressed and depressed and losing weight and not able to eat. Some people have just gone on a healthy diet and it's the act of losing a bit of weight from getting healthy has created a problem for them. But it's not yet a full on eating disorder. They're just scared of eating normally and regaining weight. And I think that's often a, a part of starvation that we don't fully understand. There's a physiological basis to that. So sometimes, so when a young girl presents, 
she may or may not be developing a major eating disorder, but there might be some risky things ringing bells and it needs a really good assessment to see what's going on. I think one of the things to keep in mind is that um, BMIs are a population measure. I hate using them for individuals because they don't reflect people's genetics, their history, their hormones, their health, anything like that really. So um, they're more useful for usually when someone's very underweight, but someone can be perfectly healthy, normal and fit and be a BMI of 30 and there is absolutely nothing wrong with them. Mm -hmm. We often have people who have dieted, they might have dieted from 160 kilos down to 80, they've lost 50% of their body weight, they're still a BMI of 26 or whatever, and they're a lot sicker than someone who has a BMI of 14. So. As, as our culture is as bigger people, the rate of weight loss and the thinking and thoughts and obsessions that go behind it are much more important than the actual weight until you get to very low weight. At very low weight, then BMI is much more useful and it's a better, it's part of the medical side of life. Um, and so we need to look beyond just what they're eating and whether they're getting their nutrition. And when we ever talk health, so don't equate weight equals health as much as possible. Health is a much bigger picture than weight. And so everybody can get a bit focused on the numbers and people can be saying, oh, that's okay, their weight's all right, or they've got to a healthy weight or whatever. But they're still very, very, very unwell. So it's weight is only part of the picture. It's not the whole picture. So normally we'd be trying to improve nutrition first, separate to the weight issue. Nutrition will need improving. There's lots of ways we can improve nutrition within someone's limited belief systems that will still improve their physiology. And it may be that that's the first thing that we're doing and someone will look at it and say, yeah, but your meal plan hasn't got anything extra on it. No, but it's actually improved the nutrition over the day, which will improve their physiology, which will hopefully help you lead you on to some other ste steps. Um, People know a lot about nutrition, but they don't know a lot about the risks. The information's are often not being used very well. And psychoeducation as a part of everything is, is always really important. And often it's over and over again. Every time the eating distorted beliefs cloud reality, you might have to repeat something again to remind people. Um, it's no good if someone stops binging and purging and then what often happens is you find they're actually restricting. Personally, I would rather someone was doing a bit of binging and purging than that they were restricting and starving. Mm -hmm. But it's often seen as a sign of success in treating someone with bulimia if they're not binging and purging without investigating it further. Um, I, it's not a good sign when someone moves from bulimic tendencies through to more anorexic tendencies, just that physiologically people can become very unwell. So it's whenever you're working with people who, and the other thing with those is being aware of transferring between behaviours. I'm, I think maybe the binging purging is better than um, switching over to more um, gambling, alcohol, drugs or whatever, and people will flip behaviours. Mm -hmm. So they might report they're binging less, but their exercise has gone up or something else has happened. Mm -hmm. So you're always remembering the big picture about what you're treating and that you're flipping, often flipping between a restrictive side of the equation and an out of control, feelings driven eating side of the equation. And that you're actually looking for something different to both sides of that equation. Something that is much more normal in focus. I guess when I'm working with clients and thinking about those kind of short term in session nutritional goals, it's always keeping in mind and something I always reflect is we've got on one hand our physical goals that Yes, we need to make sure that you're improving physiologically. And then there's the psychological goals, which is a bit more where having a food that is going to be the same nutritional value, but having a different food. So challenging the eating disorder by choosing something different, by eating something that someone else has cooked. And so sometimes it, you, know, you might get feedback from a client that their meal plan hasn't changed, but in fact the work has been done more so rather than just increasing nutritionally that, okay, let's look at a little bit of variety to help you feel like you've got a win against the eating disorder on that psychological front. Because purely looking at this, um, the physical side, sometimes they can become very safe with a particular meal plan, but then as Terrell was saying before, that becomes the new rule. So it's kind of being aware of where the client's at and whether you need to be working on both of those things at once and, and at what time. 
and understanding that people's likes and dislikes get mixed up with eating disorder mm -hmm. rules and that often we'll be asking people to do things and they say but I don't like that I've never liked it and we'll be saying but we need you to try it because it's something you may probably have to face in normal situations and that you're scared of and that in a way deciding whether you like it or dislike it is quite difficult when you're terrified of it mm -hmm. So some of it is, is about addressing, readdressing fears over time. Um, when in doubt about what we're asking people to do, I often, if you keep the long-term goals in the back of your mind, you'll usually make better decisions and better help people go in better directions. So if someone says, can I eat this or not? If I'm thinking, well, if we're heading in the direction of normal, relaxed, flexible family eating, how would that fit in that goal in the long run? Um, so, because there's always these little focused decisions all the time about the food and the eating, the weight and all the rest of it, and it's how would that fit in the long run with this idea of normal, relaxed, flexible eating, which isn't just about healthy, so, or what's perceived as healthy. And that also includes these ideas of um, being able to listen to hunger and fullness and trust those sensations and taste. So often in the early stages, basically the food is the bad medicine for a while when someone's physiologically quite unwell. Um, and helping people to do that in the best way possible. The reason for that is that um, starvation itself has powerful effects on the way the body works and on psychology. And so we have to redress that starvation in some way. Um, because otherwise the fears are too strong, the obsessions are too strong, the mood is too poor. Even though it's distressing to people to, ha to have to gain weight against their will, it currently that is a lot of our treatment in an inpatient setting. Trying to do it kindly, collaboratively, using the client as much as possible, in as normal way as possible, with food as much as possible, and in a really supportive environment but there is a role for that in treatment. Um, sometimes when people, people underneath, they do have an appetite. They may not listen to it, but they do. And when you're starving, if you trigger that appetite, it is overwhelming. Mm. How many of you might miss a bit of breakfast and morning tea, get late to lunch and you'll smell hot chips and instead of eating the salad roll, you'll eat the hot chips? <laughs> It's physiological. A lot of eating, what I tell clients is a lot of your eating is like your heart beating and your lungs breathing. It's not willpower head control. <laughs> a lot of it is just um, biological, physiological. It's not all about willpower and knowing. So a lot of the reasons we eat are driven by very basic survival mechanisms. And people can unleash very big hungers underneath that are terrifying and that can drive binging and they need to be able to understand what's happening in their bodies and why these things are happening and protective mechanisms and strategies that can help with that. Um, I'm big on about language around food and weight and eating because there is so much poor language in these areas. So, I mean, I've had two patients come to me and said my doctor called me a beast. I thought it was just a Rick Corsman mm. story, but I've had two who <laughs> come to me and said that because <laughs> I hadn't had the obesity words. <laughs> but, um, but lots of trying to encourage language which is about um, normal health and weight that's not about counting numbers and restriction and unrealistic goals. And trying to remove that judgment that we can put on so that the, the idea of the beast is yeah. a really common one that at a medical level but in fact that only um, reinforces for that person their own poor self-esteem their, their belief that they can't do it those sorts of things so it's being able to use language that okay this is just where you're at this is your weight weight and health are different we can improve health regardless those sorts of things at that end of the spectrum and a normal healthy weight is the one that comes when you're living normally and healthy mm. and it's not predictable and it's not controllable any more than it is for any of us and it's not a behavior when you're working with behaviors remember weight's not a behavior it's the outcome I call it this big melting pot 
It's the outcome over weeks and months of your genetics, your lifestyle, your hormones, the amount of sleep you get, how many stress hormones you're running on, your medications. They all get thrown in the pot and your weight's averaged out over weeks and months. So it's the, not... Yeah. The other thing that can be quite helpful to pull back, and I think I stole this from one of the dietitians in here, is that clients will always come back to weight as the focus and as the discussion point. They don't have weight disorders. These clients have eating disorders and coming back and reminding them that we're focusing on eating, <coughs> food, food behaviours, relationship with food can be really important to help them gain a bit of understanding as well and help to move away from that focus on and talking about weight and shape and size in that way. But acknowledging that that fear of weight, it's, it's not the actual weight, it's the fear of weight that's mm. the issue. Trying to help them to see that it's fear of weight is what we're working with that's overwhelming. Um, we often do the things you know, like setting regular meals and snacks, why do we have to eat six times a day, combining proteins and carbohydrates a bit so you've got a good effect on satiety, um, helping people to gain weight if they need to, helping people to see patterns of binging, eating, how to manage weight if they're overweighting, looking at all those diet cycle patterns all the time and then looking at the connections in that to their social and emotional health and helping them to take those issues then to their psychologist or psychiatrist. So we can help highlight for people the issues that need to be taken somewhere <coughs> else as well. Um, the rule of thumb we often use is try and start each day or each meal fresh. If something once doesn't work, try something else. So if you've binged or restricted today, try and start tomorrow as a whole new page. Um, or try and start the next meal and snack as a whole new page. And like we said, just being a bit aware of um, the idea that healthy and, healthy and normal are slightly different, that the outcome is not just that someone's eating all fruit and vegetables and following the um, dietary pyramidal plate or whatever, that the outcome is actually that someone can go out with their friends and have pizza for dinner and will can go to work and everyone has a cake for morning tea and that they can have some of that as well and that that's seen as normal and that they're able to do that. So, and understanding those things are important. So like um, Joe said, normal is flexible, it's got heaps of variety, it's not always logical, it's got common sense involved, yeah, I haven't eaten any fruit for a week and I feel crap, I better do something about it, but the world won't fall apart. Um, and it's different for different people in different situations. So it's always trying to understand for that client what is normal for them or in their culture, their family, their situation. Talk about that. I guess the normal versus normalising concept is something that it's looking at that while we're talking about this place we want to get clients where they're going to be able to listen to their bodies and trust themselves a little bit more, along the way a meal plan might actually be used in helping to normalise. So providing them with that structure and containment that as Terrell was saying it's outside of their head, it's outside of the eating disorder and it's a reference point. And often the process when someone's more acutely unwell or starting off in treatment, they might have what seems like quite a rigid plan and sometimes that's confusing because it seems to reflect an eating disorder behaviour. Often at that point it's about remembering that clients are really struggling and Shona put it nicely, to make those decisions and know whether it's the right decision. So having a structure can be quite helpful. And that's sort of that normalising process of yes, we're going to eat chocolate every day until you get sick of it and it's not scary anymore and you can see that nothing happens. But of course, normal eating doesn't mean you eat chocolate every day and you have to do it every day for the rest of your life. So it's being able to see that part of the process can sometimes seem a bit strange, and that's more than normalising, and getting to that point of normal eating where, yeah, okay, chocolate is no, no, no longer a problem because you think of it, you've done it so much. Mm -hmm. So I think it's sometimes good just to be able to reflect on that. Because I know even, um, you know, as a dietitian, sometimes you're sitting there going, wow, my last four clients, I've, I've set them all up to go out and have cake. <laughs> is this what I'm meant to be doing? So it's coming back to, yep, this is normalising, this is the reason, it's getting to this process. And they will be able to do this at a point on their own. And they won't need to worry about structuring it and planning it and doing it so often. <coughs> and just a reminder that we're often working with the different parts of this cycle with people and how to break this cycle down. Because even for someone with mild dieting control issues, mm. until you break the cycle down, they're unable to do things differently. 
Mm. So we have to break the cycle down as much as we can. And I've often met people who have 10 years of psychotherapy, but the behavioural stuff that's <coughs> maintaining it's never really been dealt with. Mm. So it's important to also include this in it. Um, for those of you who aren't quite sure what the difference is between weight management and dieting, so that um, that's just an idea of how we would see the difference between someone managing their weight healthily and someone who is using a more dieting approach and who might even be saying, yes, I'm seeing a dietitian following a meal plan to lose weight, but they're actually dieting. So it depends a little bit on all the things that are driving the method and the way you do it. It's sometimes not what you do, it's the way you do it that makes the difference. Um, good questions around exercise are how much is it for pleasure and health and how much is it compulsive or driven or um, that sort of stuff. How much is the success based on kilos and how much is the success based on a wide variety of outcomes and you're all measuring those outcomes. This is just examples of the sorts of things that you might do. So you might get someone to draw up their lists of safe to unsafe foods and what all the particular rules that make them unsafe and safe are um, so that you get an understanding of the eating disorder world um, and the way it works for that person. You might then draw up lists of, of that, you know, the change balance stuff. What's the advantages, what's the disadvantages, you know, in all this for me. So a lot of the work we do is, is that sort of stuff as well. Um, this was a good one someone um, gave me permission to use that just illustrated that food is not just food. So that <coughs> chocolate's comfort, reliever of pain, distress, makes me feel whole and complete. You're one that soothes me, you're a luxury, you're in fact luxurious, you're divine smooth, silky, warming, soft texture, the one that gets me through the day and the one that gets me through the night. You're my soulmate and my companion. Now that's not just a lump of fat and sugar. <laughs> You're my little, what is it? Light heroin. Yeah, you're my addiction. I'm uncontrollable around you. You're mesmerising. You're dangerous and compelling. You provide such immediate highs and then afterwards such incredible lows. You anaesthetise me. Hurt one morning off down. It's hard to get through what you'll help. You make me fat and I hate you for this. I hate the desperation you evoke in me. You're my destroyer. So, and this, these people do have these relationships with food. It is not as simple as logical, of course you can't eat several blocks of chocolate a day and be a low weight. It's never that simple for people. People wouldn't be doing these things if they had a choice. I've got a, a client who, she's probably leaning a bit towards eating more junk food and snacking and is terrified of actual meals. Yep. And we meet for lunch and the, the, a cheese and tomato sandwich is like utterly terrifying to her. Mm -hmm. She said, if I'm going to eat carbs, I'd, I'd rather eat a bag of chips. It's got a lot more That's taste right. and flavour. So yeah. that was sort of interesting to me to sort of try and, like I'm sort of, sort of pushing the healthy eating to a degree yeah. because yeah. a lot of her eating is so... So normal, so what you would say is normal meal is seen as restriction in a sense, so yeah. that, but if, if you're going to break the rules and have bread, you may as well have chips. Have it's, it's black and white, bread. all or yeah. nothing. Yeah. 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 You can't just so eat bread. Getting her to work out yeah. how to eat yep. regularly, it's not just, you know, potato chips and yeah. food. Exactly. Because the only time she's got permission to eat those foods is when she's not eating disordered. And I guess that's something that I was thinking about when we're looking at the list of, of unsafe and safe foods, that never assume. Never, never assume, assume what's safe, never assume what's not. Um, it's, it's not it's logical, no. and they don't need just education no. about this is logical, what's safe and unsafe. They usually know that. Yeah, and, and their emotions are on one side and their intellectual understanding is completely on the other. And it's about letting, I, I've had clients similar <coughs> to what you're talking about that can't do a meal, can't do vegetables but are able to do what we would perceive as being the unsafe foods for the majority. Everybody's eating disorder is completely different and it's really important to be able to come back and sit where they're at and normalise it for them that it's okay, that's their thing that's causing them an anxiety, we'll work through that part of it. So just to finish off, the, there are lots of issues for dietitians in this work. It's t intensive, time consuming, people lack confidence, they feel that it's beyond what they're trained in often and it takes a lot of time. Often people are in sole positions without a lot of psychological or medical support. Where there are ways we can help people to do that, 
but to understand that sometimes it may be difficult to get a dietitian on board for lots of very complex reasons. Um, in which case, turn to seed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so we've taken all our time. Great. Thank you. I'm really struck by the fact that there's lots of mental health professionals who have the same issues. Yes. <laughs> so no one really involves with their questions. Yeah. Five minutes for questions. Any questions? Well, you wouldn't keep a meal plan at all? Lots. Many, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you're, the, the whole session you might spend with, spend with a client is just that discussing, engaging, getting them to look at it in a different way, planting seeds, that sort of work. And um, I can think of a number of opportunities, a number of past sessions where the, I've kind of said, at the start, they're so anxious, I said, look, I'm not going to ask you to do anything when you leave here. Mm. I just, let's, let's just talk about what's going on. Mm. and really put that out there from the start and you can see them just, the anxiety drops immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, often you may barely talk about um, that sort of thing. Mm. So only if there's a reason for having it. Mm. And often have the, is there any point in me giving you a meal plan, do you think you're likely to follow it? No, well let's not do that, let's do something yeah. else. There's lots <laughs> of ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also clients work differently. So some clients love having that external, this is what I'm going to do. And other clients are quite open at saying, if you tell me to do something, I'll do the opposite. Mm -hmm. And so it's very much, okay, how are you going to go about this? And I can think of one client in particular that we never set goals and we never set things. We just plant seeds and put ideas out there. And after a few weeks, they'll come around to be doing it. And then we'll plant the next seed. And, mm -hmm. and so it's finding a way to work with the individual. Well, I think that's a dilemma too for dietitians too. Doing something. Yes, and they absolutely. And, the yes. and, and they say, well, that dietitian yep. was a dad, they didn't do anything, they that's didn't right. give you a meal plan mm. or anything. Exactly. So, you know, yeah. so, so that's why something. the client's expectations, the yeah. worker's expectations, your own expectations, it's often tricky territory. And you have to be out there and define it quite a lot. Mm. Do you ever work um, with parents? I'm working with their BT model. So mm. working Yep. Usually you're advising parents often of younger children mm. and you really are, you, all you're doing is talking to them about what would be normal, a bit of cultural awareness, mm. that type of thing and reinforcing what they need. Mm. Mm. So but yes. Sort of so it depends whether you're yeah. working in a like somewhere like the children's or wherever who's using an FPD man um, system or somewhere where there is a dedicated service where you would be part of the team working mm. with the family or if, in my case if I'm working in private practice I would mm. be supporting parents perhaps supporting child and parents but um, not usually long term because mm. I'm not particularly trained to do FPD. Mm. And I guess it is something, it's very much around the spectrum as well, because mm. I do see some families who are doing that very FPT model, but I see the whole family and I talk with the parents. Mm. And we talk about they're in charge of the meal plan, they're in charge of feeding the child, and they yep. might just ask for some advice. And, yeah. and what do you think about this? And that very normalising <coughs> around the social stuff. And then I've had other ones um, in a, a private kind of setting where I've just seen parents, I've never met the child, and it's not that I'm talking about treating that particular child, we might just talk in general terms about how to manage some of these, um, what family might be fussy health. eating, mm -hmm. and what might then become a bit more of a concern. And that whole family thing of how yeah. to help someone stop going in a preventative way down this sort of route at a whole family level. Let's face it, what parent knows what to do at the moment in the culture we're living in easily? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for letting us rave. Thank you.